Hello and welcome everybody. It is Sunday, January 28th. This is part two of a training about resilience that if you haven't seen it already, you should definitely check out the presentation or the training that we did called, you know, how to increase your resilience in developing 2024 goals. And part of that, that, that presentation was, you know, covering all the different areas of your life where you want to improve. And one of them is in order to be resilient, you have to be healthy. And one of that part of being healthy is cleaning, eating, drinking clean water. Okay. And so this presentation is what we didn't have a chance to cover in that last presentation. It's my journey down the rabbit hole of all discovering about what's in your water. So what we're going to do is as we start with all the presentations, we're going to do a two minute grounding meditation, and then we'll jump right into the training. So let's do that right now. I'm going to turn off my camera and let's begin. Hello there. And welcome to this two-minute meditation for grounding. Begin by sitting in a chair with your feet touching the floor. Relax your hands on your thighs with your palms facing upwards and close your eyes. Begin to breathe slow. Oh, let's do that over again. Hello there, and welcome to this two-minute meditation for grounding. Begin by sitting in a chair with your feet touching the floor. Relax your hands on your thighs with your palms facing upwards and close your eyes. Begin to breathe slowly in and out, noticing the feeling of how the air expands and contracts your belly and chest. Relax your body from head to toe and begin to imagine yourself in a beautiful, calming forest. Stay here and just admire the view, the trees, the sky, feeling the grass under your feet. Maybe it's autumn here and you feel the fallen leaves under your feet. As you stay here, relaxed and still, visualize how tiny roots begin to grow from the soles of your feet. These roots grow into the earth and make you feel grounded and secure. You now connect with Mother Nature's positive energy, making you feel so protected and loved. See how these roots begin to grow deeper and deeper into the earth, becoming thicker. Observe how you feel now, and when you feel ready, Move your toes and fingers, open your eyes, and continue your day filled with centeredness, confidence, and compassion. Namaste. All right, so let's jump into the training. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating in that grounding meditation. What are we going to talk about? I'm going to share with you my own journey down the rabbit hole of just discovering when I tried to have clean water in my hometown where I live, pulling up the water quality report, what I discovered, which made me start to research, what are these contaminants that are in my water, which made me study what are the health consequences of these contaminants. And it was shocking because all of you right now, when you turn on the faucet, you're thinking, you know what, my water is safe. You know, this is safe drinking water, the EPA, everybody's regulated, and we're starting to discover that that's actually not the case. And usually government agencies are always behind the ball on actually catching this stuff.
Uh, before we, I share with you my journey, I do want to have a discussion because we have different people attending this training, and I'd love to hear from all of you. What have you discovered? Like, where do you get your water? Are you using any kind of filtration system? What kind of filtration system is that? Like, do you have any idea of how much that costs you? Because again, I think that information can really be beneficial for all of us here. So I'll share with you what I learned. I'll share about the health consequences and benefits uh, of or of all these different uh, you know contaminants that are in the water. Then we're going to talk about uh, this some substance called forever chemicals. What are those? Because those were also found in the uh, in the water, and those are often called PFAS, but they have different names and different cousins. And so we'll go into a little deep dive. I have some videos that I want to show you learning about these chemicals, what they are. Then I'm also going to jump into another topic because a lot of people around the country uh, add fluoride into their water. And so originally when people added fluoride into the water, they thought, oh, because well, this is going to have a lot of health benefits for our teeth. Well, what we're starting to discover is I'm going to show you a clip of a video, and then I'm going to actually provide you an additional resource on a report that was done analyzing everything about fluoride in the water, and, and it has over 200 plus citations in terms of references to different studies about fluoride, the consequences, the health, the negative health uh, effects of it. Uh, and so we'll, we'll go down that a, a little bit, not too deeply. And then lastly, I want to end the presentation with positive action steps. What can you do to have clean water in your home? I'll show you some of the pros and cons, what I've learned in my research. And again, I just understand that some of you are, you know, uh, college students, others are working professionals, but entry level. And so therefore you don't have a lot of money or budget to buy expensive water filtration systems, but that's okay. I'll share with you what you can do on the most minimal budget level to, if you have some more uh, money, what, you, what are some of the more of the expensive water filtrations that you can use, okay? So what's in your water? Let's go down this rabbit hole. So um, before I do and jump in, why don't we start off with this discussion question? Where do you get your, uh, where do you get your water from? And, and, and do you use any filtration system? I love to jump in and ask the group, who would like to share what they do uh, and where they get their water? Can I call on some people? Who are some people that I love? To, uh, you can raise your digital hand or I can call up on you. How about uh, uh, Zohab? I see your 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 handsome face is the first one that pops up. I don't know if you can unmute yourself or if you're available. If if you can share, or, do you know where your water comes from, or are you using any water filtration system? Zohab, are you there? If not, then let me go to the next person. What about you, Kieran? If you can unmute yourself, I'd love to hear from you. Kieran's unavailable from you. All right, I'm gonna ask one more person. Susan, are you there? Reliable Susan. <laughs> I am here. All right. And, Tell me. Um, I believe that we use Culligan and I don't know how much it costs because my mother pays for it. Oh, okay, good. Well, I'm glad that you shared that because guess what? I use Culligan. Now we both live in the New York area. So Culligan is a very popular, you know, water filtration company. They have very, very good brand name recognition. Once we get to the end of the presentation, I'll share with you what uh, I have. Oh, actually, I'll share, I'll share with you right now. So Culligan is my water filtration, just like you, Susan. But with all water filtrations, there's different sources, right? You have uh, a one stage, two stage, three stage. And what is going to be, we're going to be talking is about the best water filtration is a reverse osmosis system. So Susan, do you know what, even though it's Culligan, do you, when you look underneath your sink, what, what's there? Is there one or two or three different like um, water filters? You know, do you just go above your sink and flip a switch and clean water comes out? Actually, it's a separate uh, spout. So I don't know what, what's underneath the things or anything. All I know is that they come every so often to give us salt for the cleaning system. Okay. And oh, so, so again, if they're giving salt, it might mean that you have a whole house water filtration system. Cause we'll actually talk yeah. about that as well, because uh, then, then Susan, you're really off to a good start with clean water. And then this also is my mother's thing. So yeah. yeah. 
Well, I'm also going to read the comments from Kieran here. Kieran, I saw you posted in the chat. You get your water from the New York City tap water. Okay, so where for, for those of you who live in New York, clean water from New York is considered pretty clean compared to the rest of the country because you get it up from, I, I don't believe, don't quote me on this, but it's like the Catskills or there's some area up north of New York City that pipes in all this water. So it seems to be cleaner than other places like where I live, we pump the water out of these wells. So whatever's underneath the grounds, that means if somebody pours bad chemicals on the street, gets it into the ground, well, guess what? That's gonna end up in, my, in our water. So that's a problem. But yes, New York City uh, does have pretty good tap water. I see that Kieran, you're using Breda filters. So yes, we're gonna be talk about that. Yeah, and I do not have enough knowledge about where I get my water. This is the best I got. All right, it is clean. Well, is it clean enough? Because again, this is something, Kieran, that we didn't talk about in our uh, in this training. But do you know every time that they have their water, they still treat it. They treat they treat it with chlorine. There's other chemical reactions that happen as a result. And is that really good of for your body? So even though you're thinking that I'm getting pretty good water. Is there still contamination? Is it coming through pipes that are dirty, that rust, or, or, or some break in the pipe? And so therefore sewage stuff can actually be getting into the water. You know, so that that's very, you know, uh, this is why we all have to take responsibility of getting clean water. Okay, I see uh, Corinna, if I'm, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Karina, Karina, all right, thanks Karina. Mm -hmm. You get your water from, uh, Alhambra water and Breda in Sacramento, California. Is Breda is like the Breda filter where do you pour the water into that? Tell me a little bit more. Yeah. Um, okay. It's like so a you, jug and then you pour tap water into it and it filters it. Yes. And so it kind of uses gravity and then it has the drip drip and then it, and it kind of hopefully like tastes a little better, right? <laughs> uh, and stuff like that. And then, okay, Susan, I'm also seeing your comment. We also use well water, but it's not as clean as it should be. So that's why we use Culligan. Yes, definitely. Well water. Uh, can get a lot of contaminants, especially in different systems, places throughout the country that, you know, they don't have sewers for their uh, for their disposable waste. When they flush the toilet, they may have septic tanks. So they just may have a reservoir on the ground and whatever it fills up, you know, then it leaches out into the ground. Uh, and then Kieran also says, my refrigerator is a water filter system. Again, that's very good. You know, something is better than nothing. And we're going to be talking about that. So let's uh, thank you, everybody, for sharing some of your comments about the different waters system you, you use, where you get your water, and what you're current doing. And I'm actually surprised that many of you are using Brita water filter, which is very interesting. Okay, so let's jump down. So this is where I live, okay? Uh, I live in Port Washington, New York in Nassau County. So as you can see, here's Manhattan, here's the five boroughs where all the water is actually piped in from here. But past this, there's we're no longer in the city anymore. Now we're on Long Island. And so this is Nassau County. And so if you want to know where Port Washington is, there's this one peninsula, which is Great Neck. And this is where I live, right here in Port Washington. So again, where we get our water from, most of Long Island is completely full of sand. Like, right, if you study geology, which I have, during the glacial periods, like we're talking 12,000s years ago, when glaciers were moving across, they just dumped a bunch of, once the glacier started to melt back, they dumped all the sediment. And, and that's why Long Island is full of sand and has a lot of different aquifers. That's where we pump our water from. So what I started to do is I'm like, I need to know what's in my water. So the first thing that any of you should all do is after this training is one of the recommended action steps is to say, all right, type in my hometown, all right? And because I live in Port Washington, I use your hometown water district, type in water quality report. Because again, usually by law, by different agency and standards, they do have testing of your water and they should be required uh, based on state or federal mandates to say, hey, what's in our drinking water? You know, is it clean? What are we doing to address those contaminants? So I did it. All right. I know it's very boring, but it's really important. And I started, I found this in-depth report. Now, every year, it's now 2024. So again, they're always like a year behind. So we just ended 2023. So the only report that they have available right now is the 22 report, which means that they dug into the wells, they sampled the wells, and um, and, and had some uh, all this information about the water, where it comes from. And then it starts to say, what's in our water? And if there are contaminants, 
they have to tell us so. So guess what I started reading in this very, very boring report, but it's important that we that we know it, is this. Here's what it said in this report. Contamination of the groundwater from Port Washington, okay, uh, district has been detected, uh-oh, in samples of some wells. All groundwater is pumped to the distribution system from the operating district wells, it complies with New York State Department of Health standards for public drinking water supply. So not only are they saying that we have contaminants, they're still saying that it still satisfies and meets a safety standard. It shouldn't be noted, not all drinking water, included bottled drinking water, may reasonably be expected to contain at least small amounts of some contaminants. So again, they're just kind of saying, hey, Bottled water is not always clean either. You know, it could be dirty as well. The presence of contaminants does not necessarily indicate that the water poses a health risk. Don't you love just kind of that lawyer language that you see? It's it's almost like it does not necessarily indicate. So that means it could be a health risk, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a health risk. So I just want you to be very clear on this kind of language because, again, uh, you know, contaminants pose health risk. If the question is how much contaminants are in there and how much of a health risk. So it's all a matter of degrees, right? Uh, depending on the person, you could be much more sensitive, have a much more delicate immune system, different health ailments that all the more reason why you shouldn't want to drink stuff that poses a health risk, even if it's a small amount of health risk. So let's keep going. Now, here's where I started reading. They said, okay, for us in this water report, they have what is the highest level of contaminant allowed. So please don't go past this mark, okay? They call it maximum contaminant level, MCL. So that's gonna be one of the columns in the report. And so it's like, ooh, you do not wanna get to that high because if it's that high, we ha Houston, we have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Then the next level of contaminant below that is known uh, to, you know, to as expected risk to health as known as the maximum contaminant level goal. So meaning like, okay, it's dirty, but if, if, if it says that we shouldn't have any more than 10 parts per million or parts per billion, well, then let's set a goal maybe a little below that. So we have some like margin of safety. So again, you want the MCLG to be a little bit lower than that. And hopefully your water isn't as reach the MCL level, or maybe it's a little bit below the MCLG. So again, it's it can get quite complicated, but I just wanted to share with you, this is my discovery, my journey. So as you start to read your quality water quality reports, you can have these kind of ideas. Now, what did I find? So the first blaring thing, right? Uh, yeah, and also, Susan, I wrote, noticed your comment. It depends on the ailments of those who drink it to begin with, right? Because people can have different health ailments and it can be affected in much greater degree. You're 100% right. So what did we find in my hometown of water? Nitrate contamination. Okay, nitrates, okay, what is all this about? Okay, although nitrate was detected below the MCL, so they're saying it's not the maximum, right? It was detected at 5.9 milligrams per liter, which is greater than one half of the MCL. So it's basically greater than almost 60% close to the maximum uh, contamination level. That is a concern, that is a worry. Therefore, we are required to present the following information on nitrate in drinking water. Nitrates in drinking water at levels above 10 milligrams per liter, right, is a health risk for infants of less than six months of age. So high nitrate levels in drinking water can cause blue baby syndrome. I've never heard in my life what the heck blue baby syndrome is. If you're caring for an infant, you should ask your advice from your healthcare provider. Okay, so remember, this is my journey down the rabbit hole. So I'm going to save you some time researching what this stuff is. So what is baby blue syndrome? It's called infant, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it, methyl Moglobinemia. <laughs> okay, it's also called baby blue syndrome. It's a condition where the baby skin turns blue. This happens when there is not enough oxygen in the blood. Again, that's why we have veins, right? We have blue veins, which have, you know, uh, uh, I guess not enough oxygen, and then the red veins are full of oxygen. So that's how we, we, we uh, you know, detail whether uh, blood has enough oxygen in it. What are the symptoms? Bluish skin called cy cyanosis, rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, nausea, diarrhea, lethargy, loss of consciousness, seizure. Oh my goodness. Now this is pretty crazy stuff. Like 
you know, I can just imagine parents, you know, hey, this is, you know, about maybe 60% contaminated where you can have all these issues. So kids who are maybe very sensitive could be having C. That's terrifying for a parent or a mother to find this issue. And, and, and they're just assuming that they turn on the tap water and it's completely safe. So the treatment for this is they need to give the, that child oxygen. Uh, uh, there's a, a drug called methylene blue. Uh, they can also give ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, blood transfusions, et cetera, et cetera. Prevention. Do not allow infants to drink water with nitrate in it, okay? That is spooky. If, uh, if you have a private well, like, because again, remember, wells can have a lot more contamination than maybe a municipal uh, city, you know, uh, chlorinating the water or whatever, Above 10 milligrams, then pregnant and breastfeeding women should use bottled water uh, instead of that water. So again, look at, I'm living in a hometown. I live in a suburb and it's already almost as contaminated with nitrates as a well. So that must mean there's so many contaminants that are happening in our environment with nitrogen. I'm assuming it's fertilizers and other different things that are causing this problem. So, all right, go on to the next contaminant. Now this contaminant, which I've never heard of before in my life is 1,4 dioxane. I'm like, 1,4 dioxane? What the hell is this? It's released into the environment from commercial and industrial sources, and it's associated with inactive and hazardous waste sites. Oh, fantastic. So that means there was hazardous waste sites, people, companies were dumping stuff onto whatever, cleaning agents and whatever, and it spilled into the ground, and now it's in our water. And what's crazy is, look, the MCL is supposed to be one. Where's my level? 6.2. So, oh my goodness, this is so shocking to me. So we're, we're way above maximum contaminant ratio, six times that amount. So the 1,4 dioxin contaminant was found in the district drinking water above the New York State MCL of 1.0 microgram per liter during 2021. This 1,4 dioxane MCL is set well below the level to known cause health effects in animal studies. All right, so now you can tell they're trying to downplay this. First of all, they say, this is the maximum, and now they're giving me, oh, but we've seen animal studies where it's like, oh, you really have to have even much higher levels. Then why, why did you even set it at one to begin with? So again, I'm very, I'm very suspect of that, right? Therefore, consuming water with 1,4 dioxin at these levels detected does not pose a significant health risk. So do you mean to tell me it may pose not a significant, but it could pose a small health risk, a, a, a medium-sized risk, you know, just not significant. So again, look, notice all these qualifier languages, but we're drinking this. Every time I, you know, drink water and, uh, and the water continues to be acceptable for all uses. So they're saying, hey, don't worry. It's all good. Keep drinking it. Well, I'm sorry if I don't have my full confidence, okay? So now let's research what are the health impacts of 1,4-dioxane. Uh, uh, dioxane. The US EPA has classified 1,4-dioxane dioxane as likely a human carcinogen, causes cancer. Low levels, low levels of exposure over a person's lifetime can increase the risk of cancer. High exposures over a short amount of time can damage cells in the liver, kidney, and respiratory system. This damage limits the ability of those organs to work properly. Wonderful. I'm so happy to hear uh, about these health ailments basically going down this rabbit hole. Okay, we're not done yet. So then comes the third. Uh, oh, a, a little, before I go into that third contaminant, let me tell you a little bit more about dioxane. So as you can tell, they went above the limit. You're not supposed to have this. You're supposed to have maximum one. Now we have six uh, microgram per liter. So the New York State says, we're going to give you a deferral. Okay, uh, up until November on this 2020 report, because that's when they first found it in 2020 for this water district uh, for your MCL compliance. The deferral acts as an exemption or state permission to not meet an MCL. So this is a get out of jail free card. Okay, and so under certain conditions, when a public water sewer system, right, or water system is issued a deferral, what does that mean? The water system agrees to schedule corrective action in compliance with the new PFOS, PFAs, and 1,4 dioxane MCLs. So, again, now we're starting to read in the port PFAS, you know, the forever chemicals include, and they're also talking about 1,4 dioxane. So, do you see how just because the, the municipality says, you know what, we're going to work on this, they're like, okay, you can keep giving them dirty water as long as you 
agreed to have corrective actions, that you're gonna actually work on something. You're gonna do something about this. Well, at least that's some positive method, but that's still alarming for me that I would have never known about this. How come people aren't raising the alarm? So in exchange, the New York State Department of Health uh, agrees to defer enforcement actions. So they, I guess they won't punish them. They won't find them, such as assessing fines. If uh, uh, if the P Port Washington uh, system, or no, the public water system is meeting established deadlines. So again, I don't know what those deadlines are. I don't know how long these corrective actions are, but this is alarming you know, for me. It's a concern. So now let's go into the third contaminant, the quote unquote forever chemicals, uh, the, uh, the PFAS. Now, again, PFAS have a lot of different names. They're all called per floral alkali substances, but they have all these different uh, you know, variations. Here's per flora anonic acid. Okay, that's PFNNAs. So again, you can have a whole host of these, but now notice something that's very interesting. Uh, all these substances besides PFAS, PFOs, and, and et cetera, et cetera, are considered unspecified organic compounds. Now, I've always heard of volatile organic compounds, so this is interesting that they're calling these unspecified organic contaminants, which have an MCL of 0.5 milligrams, okay? So now I'm starting to get confused because they're now using different using units of measure. Now they're saying that maybe they've changed it to say this is, okay, this is what the MCL is, 50,000, which I think is some kind of math conversion in whatever data point this is. And so they're saying, well, you, we have 2.6 here, 4 point, but let's look at what the difference is. You know, this is the maximum contaminant level and you're not so much. So you haven't even reached this 50,000 level. So to me, I want you to uh, make that point because we're gonna come back to this. There's something a little suspect. One of the things that always is a concern, imagine you were working in a municipality and you wouldn't want to alarm the public. You can manipulate data and, and, and change different uh, things so that you can always put lipstick on a pig. To me, this is putting lipstick on a pig, okay? Let's, uh, let's go deep down and learn what are the health effects of these PFAS. They cause cancer, all right? low birth weight, thyroid problems and diseases, and other diseases, okay, all because of these forever chemicals. So now we're going to take a moment and we're going to go down the rabbit hole of these PFAS. Let's learn a little bit more about them and uh, what what this, uh, you know, uh, we have to say about this. So let's check this out right now. All right, let's play this from the beginning. Thanks, YouTube. It's acting funky. There we go. Here we go. The PFAS family, but the here we go. Medcram.com. Well, welcome to another MedCram lecture. Today we're going to talk about forever chemicals. These are technologically advanced substances that are used in all sorts of things today, like pans that don't stick, things that don't break down, foams in fire retardants, clothes, things that don't stain. Basically, better living through chemicals, things that make our life easier. And there's something about these structures, which we'll talk about, that make them that way. And unfortunately, because of that, they don't break down. They don't break down on purpose. And so whereas normal substances might break down in a number of months to years in the environment and break down into their normal parts, these things stick around literally for thousands of years. And unfortunately, the science is telling us that these things can actually cause harm in living systems. So we're going to talk about what these are, where they came from, why they are the way they are, and what we can do about it. Now, the term forever chemicals actually came about about four years ago by a professor at Harvard that we actually had here on MedCram, Dr. Joseph Allen, talking about ventilation, you may recall. But we also talked to him about these forever chemicals. And there's literally hundreds and hundreds of them, but we're going to talk about a few. And as you'll see, that's the problem, is that there are a few that get used, but there's really hundreds of them that can be used. So what do we do? Let's take a deep dive and look at what is going on. So as I mentioned, there's a bunch of these, but we're going to talk about primarily two of them today, two types. First one are called PFAs or PFAS, and that stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And another group is known as the bisphenols. Now you may recognize this bisphenols. This is basically two and phenol groups. So if you know what that looks like, it's a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group on it, coupled together with something identical on the other side. And there's something called bisphenol A, that's known as BPA, you may have heard of that, but there's also BPB, there's BPAF, 
There is BPS. In fact, there's over 200 of these types of bisphenols, basically with different groups attached on both sides. They have very similar properties. They're used a lot in plastics, but can have issues in the human body in terms of hormone regulation. On the other hand, the PFAS over here tend to use the carbon fluoride bond, which is a very strong bond, as the core of these substances. And so you'll have something called PFOA, which stands for perfluorooctanoic acid. And another one is PFOS, which stands for perfluorooctane sulfonic acid. And yet another one is known as Gen X. No, this is not the generation that was born from 1965 to 1980, but it's actually a substance. It stands for hexafluoropropylene oxide dimer acid. And we won't write that down because that looks pretty complicated. Just note as Gen X. This is Gen X. As you can see here, there's a lot of these carbon fluoride bonds. These things are very, very stable. Take a long time for them to break down. Also, these things have a tendency to basically allow air to pass through without allowing grease and other substances. So they're great for coating things if you don't want things to stick. So it's used a lot in non-stick pans. It's also really hard to destroy, so it's used a lot in fire protection. It's also used in furniture, clothing, things of that nature. And here's a structure of PFOA and PFOS, highly fluorinated carbons. And you can see some other substances as well that are also highly fluorinated. That's the issue is that you can make almost endless combinations of structures that have lots of fluorine atoms connected to carbons. But the ones that are most commonly seen are the PFOA and PFOS. So what's the big news this week? In June of 2022, after being really pushed and prodded by a organization called the Environmental Work Group, which is a nonprofit, pushing the EPA to come up with better standards for monitoring these forever chemicals. The EPA finally says that they have found really no safe level for two toxic forever chemicals found in many U.S. water systems. And the reason why I say there that it's found in many U.S. water systems is that it's really not being checked in a number of different systems. And the two chemicals that we're talking about are PFOA and PFOS. And they've been linked to different types of cancer, low birth weights, thyroid disease, and other health ailments. And that's really the reason why we're talking about it here at MedCram. And what this article says is that the agency is now saying that any detectable amounts of PFOA and PFOS are unsafe to consume. All right. And now I'm also going to show you a later clip because here's what ends up happening is even though that they're finding these chemicals, industries finds other cousin chemicals to actually find as substitutes and it's still causing problems. So I'm just going to show you this, this very good uh, section of this interview. Check this out. Here we go. And for those of you who are familiar with MedCram, we actually talked to Professor Joseph Allen out of the Harvard Public School of Health, the man who actually coined the term forever chemicals about this very topic. Listen as Kyle interviews Dr. Allen about why BPA-free products may not be all they're cracked up to be. I want to ask you about uh, some of the products that we all have in our homes or use every day. And I have a water bottle here that uh, says BPA-free on it. And when I read some of your book, when you talk about how um, some of these chemicals, it's like chemical whack-a-mole, I think was the term you used. Um, so could you, could you talk a little bit about that, why something like BPA-free may not give the security that we hope it would? Yeah, so moving to the topic of chemicals, this is a, a massive topic that doesn't get enough attention. It's something I've been studying for a long time, and uh, you really get me going because, yeah, there's a chapter in the middle of our book. I'm not trying to sell a book here, um, but it talks about our global chemical experiment. And I promise if you read it, uh, uh, it, sh it should shock you. It should absolutely shock you because there's an assumption that the products we buy are safe and that we don't that if there was a chemical that was toxic well of course it shouldn't be in your water bottle or my couch or my kid's child you know car seat um but th here's how it works and here's the problem for over 80,000 chemicals in commerce very few have been tested for health and safety and so what happens is we don't follow the precautionary principle we allow companies to put these chemicals in commerce and then if we the scientists find out it's harmful they take it out but what happens is they often replace the toxic chemical with a chemical cousin that's just as toxic. And we call this chemical whack-a-mole. And it's this never-ending game that's been played for decades. And BPA is a great example. So if you're a, a customer, uh, you know, you're, you're well-meaning, you know, you look at your bottle, okay, there's two bottles, one says BPA-free. Well, I must, I'll get the BPA-free one, right? A BPA must be bad, even if you know nothing about BPA. And BPA stands for bisphenol A. It's a hormone-disrupting uh, chemical that's used in some plastics. The reality is, though, BPA got a bad rap. And so manufacturers seized on this and they said, well, I'm going to sell BPA free everything. They didn't just take out BPA. They took out BPA, but they replaced it with its chemical cousin, BPS, for bisphenol S. Sure enough, the toxicological profile looks exactly the same, darn near similar to BPA. So that way they played a game with you as a consumer. BPA free is great. That label might as well say it contains BPS. BPS is starting to get a bad rap. You know what the replacement is? BPF. 
This goes on and on. Uh, we, we've seen this with pesticides decades ago. We see this chemical whack-a-mole in nail polish. We see swapping of chemicals in e-cigarettes. We see this in flame retardants in, that are in your couch, in my couch. Uh, we see this with these forever chemicals, these stain repellent chemicals that uh, can cause testicular cancer that you find in nonstick pans that are used uh, on carpets. And there was one that was labeled bad. Okay, that was removed. And it was just subbed in for another one. So this game of chemical whack-a-mole uh, happens all the time. And, and we sometimes call it uh, regrettable substitution is the less playful name for it. But it's another name I don't like, you know, because it implies there's, oh, whoops, we made a mistake. It's a regrettable substitution. Whoops. This has been happening for decades. There's nothing regrettable about it. It's a knowing uh, failure of the system and a loophole in our chemical policy. And here's where it's interesting for all of us and everybody. These chemicals, they migrate out of their products. If you take something like these forever chemicals um, that are the ones that are in your nonstick pans and, and in your carpets and, and they're on our clothes, it makes things, you know, water and soil just wash off these days. It's amazing. We love them as consumers. Um, well, these things are really pernicious. I mean, they last in the environment forever. I wrote an op-ed calling them forever chemicals and named them that two or three years ago at this point when that piece came out. Um, but they're associated with these harmful effects carcinogenic effects. Uh, they're associated with, they're called obesogens. They interfere with lipid metabolism. Um, so we have all of these, you know, uh, uh, known adverse effects. We keep using them and we have this chemical whack-a-mole. And the problem with these forever chemicals is there's like, at this point, 6,000 variants. So what do we even study next, right? Uh, so as a consumer, we really have no chance to be like a thoughtful consumer and avoid these things because it's a totally, uh, it's a totally broken system. Any specific recommendations for people to help navigate this this landscape of uh, of chemical whack-a-mole and, and finding products that are safe to use? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think the first thing is is uh, all getting informed about this, right? Because I think few people know this is going on. Again, I'm not trying to sell a book here, but you can find, you know, look up Forever Chemicals. Look up I, this op-ed on chemical whack-a-mole. Uh, if you're interested, read that chapter, and you'd be really surprised. And then we can start asking for it. I'll say from a, from a, a system standpoint, we're trying to address this through my Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard with Harvard's Office for Sustainability. We created the Harvard Healthy Materials Academy. And what we're doing is um, we're starting to change buying practices. So instead of a company saying, well, here's something that doesn't have BPA, we're starting to ask and say, well, what else is in it? And by the way, we don't want anything in that whole class of chemicals, right? We're not gonna play this whack-a-mole game. Forever chemicals, we don't want any of them. I don't care what your next safe replacement is that you tell us is safe that we'll find out is toxic. And we're having a lot of success. We have 40 pilot projects, over 40 pilot projects on our campus, where we're showing that you can design these spaces with great products that don't impact cost or time of your project. Uh, they look great, perform the same, and you don't have the toxic chemicals in them. So there's a way to do it. And we're trying to move that with the market. We partnered with Google two years ago on this uh, initiative. Many other manufacturers, big companies are starting to put their buying power uh, behind this movement to kind of rid the, the market of these um, you know, these toxic chemicals that uh, that are in everything. There are, are deodorants and shampoos. I don't use shampoo as a bad example for me. Uh, but in our couches, chairs, you know, they're all around us. And so the, I, the way to do it is to move upstream and, um, and change the, the whole system. All right. So I hope that you found that as interesting as I did in terms of what's really going on in terms of these chemicals and how it's so difficult for us to, you know, trust oh okay this is a new chemical we banned it government is always it almost seems like one step behind you know uh you know, trying to catch these uh, individuals from from contaminating us so again it's very shocking very interesting so i hope you found it as educational as i i did but the main point that i wanted to get out from there is the epa found that there are no safe levels of these chemicals in our drinking water Okay, very, very, very important. Now, there is another YouTube channel, which I'm a very big fan of. I was also featured on, uh, you know, one of their videos when we were talking about Alzheimer's. Um, but it's about, uh, you know, plant choppers. And they did this whole episode about these forever chemicals. And guess what? Not only are they in our drinking water, but they're also in our food. Now, I'm going to send this video as an additional resource because I don't want to take up so much time sharing this whole video, but it's pretty, really well done. Very cool. So I took a couple of clips from this video so that I could just highlight it in the presentation. So let me share with you what they are. Again, about PFAS, they're in your shampoo. They're in your nonstick cookware. So I used to have Teflon plans. I do not use Teflon pans anymore in our house. Uh, we have now moved to uh, nonstick ceramic pans. We've also done stainless steel pans, 
but it takes some skill to be able to either put some olive oil and heat it up to the right amount where you can put something that doesn't stick. But sometimes it often does stick, so it's very frustrating. So that's why I'm a big fan of, we have a, like a little small little uh, ceramic pan and we have a much larger one. So that's what we use. It also is found in stain resistant products, photography, firefighting foams like fire extinguishers, fast food packaging. It's found in pesticides, paints, et cetera. And just as a, a side comment, you know, one of the things that I've been doing and that we talked about this in resilience training part one, which is all about saving money. You know, uh, one of the things that I've now been doing because all these chemicals, they're in our detergents and everything like that is can we make our own healthier products? Now, again, some of you may shop and go to Whole Foods and buy maybe like seventh generation is a very common brand. It's a very environmental friendly or, you know, Whole Foods 365 brand, whatever it may be. But what my wife and I have started doing is we started actually making our own laundry detergent. Yeah, you can actually go through a recipe online by baking soda, iodized salt, laundry detergent baking soda, uh, mix them all together uh, with also some Epsom salt and then add some essential oils and you created your own detergent powder. And it's almost like one third the cost of, of buying it in the supermarket. So again, there's a lot of other things. I'm not telling you all to go uh, to that extreme, but uh, it's to be very conscious of the, uh, the things that you buy and the things that you purchase. So where are all these PFAS contamination? It's all over the country. Look at all these different waste site treatment plants. Uh, there's military sites that have this contamination. And we believe that all these locations, uh, based on research, seem to have some PFAS contamination, which is just shocking, you know. Um, then how does it get into our food? Where are our vegetables? How can we reduce the amount of these, you know, cancer-causing substances? Well, unfortunately, a lot of is found in water, which is what the main purpose of this presentation is about, right? But I guess where it's also found meat and meat products, probably because of that bioaccumulation, they absorbing it, uh, absorbing it and consuming it and eating it from, uh, it can be found like, I guess, in, in the grasses and whatever, whatever they're consuming, it's, it's, it's in high quantity. So, Again, sorry to all those keto meat eaters, but there may be some benefits of actually health benefits of reducing them out. Again, uh, you know, do your own research, but uh, I found this, this uh, very insightful and interesting. All right, so now we've talked about PFAS. Uh, we've talked about, um, you know, uh, nitrate contamination. We've talked about, um, you know, 1,4-dioxane. A lot of those chemicals can be removed from the water by water filtration, but we're going to talk about that at the end of the presentation. So what we're going to talk about right now is another contaminant that's in our water is fluoride in the water. Now, according to Port Washington, when I read the quality report, Port Washington does not add fluoride in the water, but other counties, other cities do add fluoride in the water. And it was all sold as a health benefit. So part of this training was part of a level three and Spirit Science is a very good YouTube channel. They talk about, for some of you who are, might not be into the woo-woo stuff, they actually did a 90-minute uh, documentary talking about, you know how there's so many internet conspiracies? Well, they did a really good job to try to say, well, let's see if we can really do a deep dive in some of all these different things. And one of the things that they examined is, you know, since this channel is really focused on spirituality, consciousness, as well as science, they tackled the topic of fluoride in the water. And so what they're finding is that it can actually have an impact on your pineal gland, right? Uh, your pineal gland, if you study in science and research, is, r r affects melatonin. And those of you know, melatonin can affect your sleep cycles. Uh, many in the spiritual community consider the pineal gland, the third eye, our connection to the heavens, a higher different sp uh, you know, spiritual awareness uh, and connection to universal source, right? But what I'm just going to show you this clip of this video, again, take it with a grain of salt, um, but, you know, just let's see what they say about uh, fluoride in the water. And again, to me, this just should cause you, I'm not saying everything is 100% true, but it should invite you to go and do your own research. And I'm going to give you some other resources that you can do a much in-depth go down the rabbit hole with fluoride water. So let's check this out. 2212. Deep into it here, because there is a lot to cover. But if you want to go deeper into this, please watch that movie after this one is done. Ultimately, though, the bottom line here appears to be that we are what we eat, 
and most of us eat far too much, and in that, consume too many harmful substances. Fluoride in the water. Some have said that fluoride is the metaphorical tears of the New World Order, and that it's their most widely used weapon against us. The idea, in a nutshell, is that governments put fluoride in our water supply in order to negatively affect huge populations and facilitate mass control, whether for financial gain through the health defects that it causes or for the purpose of disrupting our connection to the spiritual planes. Any quick search of a fluoride conspiracy brings up notions that it calcifies the pineal gland, the organ in our brain that is often linked to consciousness and the third eye. The idea of the pineal gland being linked with consciousness originally came from the French philosopher Descartes, who argued that the interaction between non-local consciousness and the physical world occurred inside of it. If you dig into why water fluoridation began, you find a convoluted, suspicious mess, mostly centering around the aluminum production company Alcoa, who supposedly had a lot of toxic waste to spare that took the form of fluoride as a byproduct of aluminum production. After a single biochemist who was sponsored by them showed in a lab that fluoride affects cavities in rats in 1939, so the story goes, the first public proposal that the U.S. should fluoridate its water supplies were made, not by a doctor, but by an industry scientist. Nowadays, our water is fluoridated in over 24 countries, mostly in the Western world. According to chemist and researcher Charles E. Perkins, who wrote the book The Truth About Water Fluoridation, Repeated doses of infinitesimal amounts of fluoride will in time reduce an individual's ability to resist domination by slowly poisoning a certain area of the brain, thus making them submissive to the will of those who wish to govern them. While there are unsupported theories that the Nazis used the chemical in concentration camps or the USSR in their gulags, the threat of fluoride isn't just a theory. The work of Jennifer Luke in the 90s showed that by old age, the pineal gland contains the same amount of fluoride as teeth, having been calcified as we age. Further, a huge review on fluoride toxicity published by the National Research Council in 2006 reported a range of negative side effects from fluoride, including decreased melatonin production and other effects on normal pineal function, which in turn could contribute to a variety of bad effects in humans. In fact, studies from Harvard and China's Shanghai Health Institute may even have linked fluoride to reduced IQ in children and even suggest that it could be toxic to a developing brain. As well as being linked to certain types of cancer, it's also been shown to destroy the male reproductive system in rabbits. The bottom line is, the benefit to risk ratio on water fluoridation is unclear due to a lack of good evidence, with most people not even knowing that they're drinking it. If the conspiracy theories are to be believed, professors doing this research have been met with numerous attempts to discredit them. Stephen Peckham, director of the Center for Health Services at the University of Kent, and professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine at the University of Toronto, has had his research of water fluoridation rejected from dental health journals. He's even spoken out about being accused of statistics hacking and for research that made the link between fluoride and hypothyroidism. It seems as though someone does not want this info getting out. Enter. Okay. So again, very interesting. Uh, I'll let you guys decide whether you guys want to go down that rabbit hole. But again, I just want to provide you different perspectives. I want to also share with you additional research that you can do on your own. Uh, for those of you who went through level one training uh, and level two, I really talked about health. And one of the people that I studied, this was back in the 1990s, was this alternative, uh, you know, uh, you know, I would call him a health advocate, right? Gary Null, he's very controversial if you look up because he does he gets involved in terms of political issues and things like that. Well, he warned about fluoride in the water years ago. I'm talking about over like, you know, 30 to 40 years ago, warning about the, the fluoride in the water. And my parents, my grandparents knew about the dangers of fluoride a long time ago. And he actually has this article. I'm going to share this as an additional resource because he actually goes through the whole entire history. He includes 241 citations, including referencing different studies that you can actually look at this. And as you can tell, one of them was uh, as in that video, in that spirit science video about the conspiracies, it was basically said, it mentioned that study in China where they found that, that children exposed uh, to fluoride were actually affecting their IQ. 
And again, uh, they've also shown reproductive uh, effects of, right? Right, when they actually um, did this on chinchillas and they fed them this high fluoride diet. And as a result, they had reduced the number of offspring. And when they removed the fluoride, they tended to have more offspring. So again, very interesting things. I couldn't go down deep this rabbit hole for this training about fluoride, but I just really wanted to give you a taste of it. And if there is... Uh, when you do your research, if there is fluoride added into your water, you know, that's something that you can uh, remove with the help of reverse osmosis uh, water filtration. Now, uh, I'm not going to go down in terms of the discussion of is fluoride even beneficial for your teeth. According to some research, it is, you know, it can kind of harden the teeth, it can maybe reduce cavities, but how effective is it at reducing cavities? And, and there's a difference between brushing your teeth and, um, you know, and then spitting it out and having very minor amounts of it in your toothpaste or whatever, versus actually doing Floyd rinses, which you could actually swallow and now you're getting it into your body or drinking it in your water, that even there's warning labels on uh, fluoride rinses, you know, for cavities, they say, please do not swallow this. So again, I think that the evidence is out there that this is a very dangerous chemical and it should not be ingested. Um, maximum should be even uh, used for your teeth, if at all, right? So again, uh, something for you guys to do additional research on. Now, let's start talking about proactive. You're like, Tim, you've depressed us enough. You talked about all the contaminants in your water. Well, what can you do to help clean up your water? So I'm going to start off with from the most basic fundamental to other different action steps you can take from the cheapest to the most expensive. So let's start off. The first thing that you should do as an action step is research water quality report in your area. And if it's contaminated, well, you have options. <laughs> you know, one is maybe don't use the municipal water. See if you can find a cheaper cost, uh, cost alternative of having it, bringing it in. I know a lot of my um, family who lives out in California, they have Costco deliver purified drinking water, you know, and get deliveries. Or I've seen even units where, uh, you know, whatever it may be, uh, getting water sourced from somewhere else. Or consider maybe you can't move right now, but as you start to think about when you move to a new area or home, Maybe something that you should do, not only look about what the houses cost or what the taxes are, look what the water quality is and what's the source and are there contaminants because you should want to have provide you, your future children or whatever, clean water. OK, so that's what I recommend as the first most minimal step. Second is water filtration. So many of you members who had mentioned on the chat and then shared during our discussion are using Brita filters. Now, again, Brita is the uh, spelled B-R-I-T-A. Is, is a common name brand that really exposed a very, very easy water filtration system. And I actually shop at Costco and they actually sell their own Kirkland version of Brita filters and have their replacement filters. And so it's actually even much cheaper. And so what you do is, you know, you fill the water in and sometimes they have two gallon ones where you can fill it in like a much bigger one. And so you can just get clean water. Now, here's the problem with the Brita filter. It's very not expensive for those people on limited budget, but how is it filtering that water? It's using gravity, okay? Whatever gravity can do to help filter through that water. And in order for it to filter very, very difficultly, you would need pressure to go through. But because uh, if, if it's a very good filter and there's no pressure, they can't make it uh, as fine as they would like it to be. So while though it's not the best, it's something that's better than nothing, right? But here I wanted to share with you from the comparison of the what is the known as the best water filtration, which is reverse osmosis versus uh, just a simple carbon filter used by gravity. Yes, uh, Brita can help improve bad taste. It can help, you know, improve the odor of maybe some water. Maybe it, it tastes very chlorinated, so it might improve that. Turbidity, right? Um, uh, volatile or organic compounds such as pesticides, it does remove some of those pesticides and those big organic compounds. Chlorine, yes, it removes that, but it doesn't remove all bacteria. It does not remove all viruses. Arsenic, it does not remove heavy metals. It may review some of them. Uh, dissolved solid, uh, solid sodium calcium, it does not remove. And guess what? Fluoride, it does not remove that either. So again, something is better than nothing. So if you can, if that's all you can afford, do it. 
but look at the difference of what reverse osmosis does for you, okay? So what's the next best filtration besides a, a gravity felt filter? Is a filter that uses water pressure. So not only is it, oh, it's really tough to get through, but if you, with water pressure, we can actually clean the water and more of those compounds or those contaminants can attach to those filters, most often a carbon filter, which really does a good job of capturing chemicals, volatile organic compounds, things like that. So right now, and I think this is something Kieran even mentioned in the chat, that many refrigerators, right, they connect water to a refrigerator and to make ice and water where you put your cup, they usually have a little simple uh, filter that maybe costs 20 to 40 bucks a year and you replace it once in a while. Again, it's using pressure to go through that. So that's something that's better than nothing. Other people, Brita has this version where, guess what, you attach it to the faucet of your sink. Again, is this going to be better than the other filtration of Brita, you know, with gravity filter? The answer is yes. Why? Because it's using pressure. And then the last one is sometimes you can get these one single units that are very easy to install. You just screw it on the bottom of the sink uh, and it goes through this one major filter and you just, you know, flip it on, uh, flip the switch and the water will go through that filter into your cup. Again, the cost it's different in different areas. I live in New York, so things tend to be a little bit more expensive here than the rest of the country. But again, you can buy different filtrations anywhere between $50 and $100 a year and maybe have some, you know, a replacement filter. So what's the next best thing after this one stage filtration is a two stage or three stage filtration. Now, I'm going to confess, I have this three stage filter system in my house, in uh, the main floor where I live in my kitchen. And you're like, you might say, well, Tim, how come you don't have reverse osmosis filter? You've been advocating for it. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, it can be very expensive. So when I had to get a new system, you know, you can't always, uh, based on your budget, afford it. I actually do have a reverse osmosis system in our basement where my grandmother, uh, not my grandmother, my mother-in-law lives. So that actually has a reverse osmosis system, but in our house on our main floor, it's a three-stage. Something is better than nothing. So typically in a three-stage filter, usually the first one gets rid of the biggest stuff like sediment, sand, rust, whatever it might be. Number two, again, more metals and things and it's gonna capture. And then the last one is a big carbon filter and that is gonna take out the volatile organic compounds, right? And so this unit that I have in the house for me here in New York, it was about $1,000, right? So uh, $900, um, again, that's us using Culligan to use that filtration. And then once a year, depending how much water we use, we will then have to call the plumber or not the plumber, the, the company, and they'll replace all three filters once and we'll, you know, they'll charge us 300 bucks for it. Do you need to use a company? No, there are other systems that you may be able to install yourself, but we're dealing with plumbing here. So not many people are really good at that. So if you can't do a three stage, there's another version, which is a two stage. Again, this is also very popular that I've seen. Something is better than nothing. All right. The next, or what I say is the best is the reverse osmosis system, right? And that reverse osmosis system is usually a four to five stage. And again, this is underneath the stink. Now, not all um, the different um, systems have tanks. So for example, the, one of the benefits of having this three-stage filter system is I don't have a tank under my sink, so it's really good at saving space. But if you're going to have to do reverse osmosis system, remember, uh, I just know this from my research, it takes about five gallons of waters to go through that all those filters to get one gallon of clean water, right? Through all these different, so they have a sediment filter, carbon, a, a membrane, and another uh, membrane. And remember, it, it, these membranes are so small that only the tiniest, you know, water particles can get through. Reverse, you know, in terms of water filtration, it's distillation followed by reverse osmosis. Like that's how good reverse osmosis is, right? It's one level below distillation. But here is the 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 challenge with reverse osmosis. It's expensive. So where I live, it cost about two thousand dollars to get one of these four filter systems, and it comes with a tank. And yes, I flip the, I have a separate spout right next to my sink that I just have that water uh, and especially in my basement. Now, here's an important thing. Do you know that even though I use Culligan, just like um, Susan's mother uses Culligan, 
Um, you don't have to use Culligan or some other name brand. That can be costly, like two thousand dollars plus a three hundred dollar uh, visit plus you know uh, the filters may be, be like fifty dollars for each one. That starts to add up for a lot of people. But guess what you can do? I've even found Amazon sells reverse osmosis systems online. Now again, I'm not going to vouch for it. Because right before this training, I clipped this picture, this whole unit, they say that it costed about like $150 if I could buy it on Amazon. That's very inexpensive. But what they're not telling you is how much it, it, it takes a lot of work, right? You have to actually go under the sink. You have to install it. You have to get these pipes. You have to, you know, like cut and, and, and connect tubes. Most of you are not plumbers, or but some of you who are very handy might be able to do that. What if it gets clogged up? What if it's not working? You know, you then have to problem solve. So even though I would, if you are such in a low budget and you need to have something but can't afford the very expensive systems, then yeah, uh, do your research, find some reviews, hire a plumber to install this unit. And guess what? You know, uh, just then replace the filters yourself so what instead of spending a 2000 installation it's 150 installation with maybe a hundred uh, uh to 200 bucks a year in cost of replacing filters not so bad now the other thing that i'll tell you about reverse osmosis filters is it's so good at filtering out the water it actually removes um important minerals from the water so that's why some of the more expensive 2000 units they will usually add minerals back into the water in order to adjust the pH. Because if you have filter out the water and you take out all those ions and all those minerals, well, guess what? That can make the, the water a little bit, um, affect the pH of the water. So our body needs minerals from our water. So you either need to buy a, a little bottle of trace minerals, which is what I have in my home, and that we kind of add it to the water, whatever we might be doing, or some units already come with calcium, magnesium, and stuff like that. And as it filters through the water, it adds the minerals back. So again, there's some pretty cool systems. I would say when I when I first interviewed somebody at Culligan about different water filtration systems, here's something that he uh, warned me about. A lot of the new systems try to use technology like, ooh, look at this, this is Bluetooth connected. Ooh, we have a light system that says, this is the time when we need to filter. I'm sorry to confess this, but whenever you add technology, electricity, you know, Bluetooth, all these other things, um, you increase the chances of issues coming up, right? With wires, you know, electricity, connectivity, and stuff like that. Try to make it as simple, basic as possible, right? Uh, you're going to be much better off, all right? So that's uh, water filtration, the best one that I found. And then the last one is a home, entire water filtration system. Now, this is just a sample image. Sometimes people can just buy a very uh, simple system. However, what Susan was mentioning before, where she's like, oh, I think the Culligan adds the salt. Well, guess what? It does not make sense for people to have reverse osmosis water in their entire house. Let me tell you why. Because most of the water that you're going to use in your house is for drinking, right? Uh, only 1% of the water used in your house is for drinking and for cooking and stuff like that. Most of the water, flushing down the toilet, taking a shower, all those other kind of stuff, you're not drinking the water. Now, again, it would be great that we could have uh, you know, reverse osmosis for the entire house. It's just way too damn expensive to be able to do that. So what they often do, and this is what I found out from Culligan, is that they have this two filtration system where one is a vat that they fill with salt, and then the other is a carbon filter. So again, the water goes through the salt, the salt absorbs any kind of contaminants and things like that. And then once it goes through that carbon filter, it cleans it. So what ends up happening is if you if this whole system here in New York, I found out what it cost me, it would cost me $4,500 to install that. That's a lot of money, right? But if you want that clean water, well, that's what you have to do because, and then maybe the cost might be $300 a year. Now, every once in a while, you need to add salt into your system because it will start to deplete because it uses it to clean the water. And then the next thing is you're going to have to actually replace that carbon filter. Now, if your house has that, 
plus a reverse osmosis under the stink, well, that's the best of both worlds. And so instead of replacing your, your reverse osmosis filters once a year, if you have this home water system, maybe you can do it every two years or a year and a half. So uh, again, <laughs> uh, that, that's what you can do. Um, all right. So that is a summary of it. Uh, we went down the, the rabbit hole of understanding clean water. We had a discussion. Uh, what did I find in my contaminants in my water? Nitrate, 1,4-dioxane, and PFAS, the forever chemicals. Again, these chemicals can cause cancer, low birth weight, thyroid problems. We talked about fluoride in the water. Again, I'll send you some additional resources that, that cause reproductive problems, as well as lowering your IQ, as well as for the, you know, affecting your pineal gland, which is your sleep cycles, as well as your connection to your consciousness, right? Your spirituality, your third eye. And then lastly, we talked about all the different water filtration systems. If you don't have one, or if you have Brita, maybe it's time for you to step up to the next level of water filtration system. But first step, do your water research and then talk about getting a new uh, water filtration system. So at this point, I'll take any questions anybody might have. You know, I appreciate uh, all of you who have listened and for all of you who will be watching the recording. So does anybody have any questions? All right. Does anybody have any final comments that they like to share? Karina, how about you? Any final thoughts or comments about the training presentation? Um, I enjoyed the training. <laughs> I um, think it's really interesting, the different water techniques that uh, techniques of purifying it. I know at my dad's house, they have a bigger like tank under the sink. Yeah. And um, I've noticed that it does like, if you're filling up water for like sports or something like that, um, it takes so long. And as you said, with like five gallons, it filters out like kind of slow, but the water does taste better. Yeah. Um, and I have never looked into Sacramento guidelines of water filtration, but that is a cool thing that I will look into. Awesome. Um, I think my question is, how, um, what would you advise, how would you um, educate that to more like a younger crowd of people, how they can um, not only educate like themselves on water filtration, but how they can advocate outside of their own thoughts. Ooh, all right. That's a deep question. So again, let me just kind of repeat it back to you so I understand. So what can we do to help educate more people about this water filtration system and what they can do proactively to have clean water? Is it, Did I good summarize your question? Yes. Okay. So uh, I think what you're doing is the perfect thing right now is number one is let me do a research, do a Google search, my hometown, what is my water uh, quality and what are the contaminants in my water, okay? The second thing that I, that I would say is a, an action step is once I send out this recording, I'm going to send you some of these additional videos. Like for example, the plant chomper videos about PFAS, right? So that these, you know, again, I just did a high level overview of my journey and I hope to educate you, but it is important for you to watch these other videos and these other resources to educate yourself about them. Uh, so that's in, definitely in action. And I'm going to actually turn this training into a YouTube video. So again, anybody who watches this, you know, share it with people so that other people can benefit and learn about water contamination and, and that their home area is dirty for the water. Uh, and it, it, you know, that their area has most likely contamination in their water and that they should do something about it. Now, in terms of what they can do as an individual level is... I remember that if I, I'll just tell you what I'm doing, right? What I'm doing now differently than I ever did before is I try to avoid, you know, you have to understand that perfection is the enemy of the good, 
right? So again, you can always go crazy. I'm like, ah, I need to have the cleanest water. I won't drink any other water. You know, I, I would say is it's, it's try to do the best in each given situation, right? So this whole presentation was about contaminants, right? Not only that are in the water, but that are in plastics and stuff like that. I have now moved away from actually drinking water out of plastic bottles. Uh, I have moved away of actually using um, metal, right? Like, you know, those thermos cans and filling up water before I leave the house and always like kind of keep it in my car uh, whenever I have to go different places. So I always use that because I do not want plastic or warm heat, uh, you know, uh, in my water or leaching into my into my water. So that's the one thing that they do use glass or um, stainless steel. Now, my wife, she actually now uses drinks water every day at her job. But she bought a glass kind of like reusable bottle because she wanted to avoid the plastic because again, what did we learn in this presentation? BPAs, they're just going to say BPA free, but they just used another chemical. You cannot trust it, right? So in that sense, she prefers glass, which is highly recommended, but guess what? It can break more easily. So what she has is a little kind of like a silicone insulation um, cover for it that she got, I believe, on Amazon. So again, she has to be more careful, but guess what? She gets to drink out of glass water versus the stainless steel. So that's uh, something that that uh, she could do or you could do. The next Thank thing, you. oh yeah, no problem. And uh, I'll just go above and beyond. Get rid of your ceramic uh, Teflon uh, frying pans, you know, in your house. Uh, I'm going to share you this one little anecdote that's pretty creepy. I'm not a, a veterinarian. I'm not a veterinary technician, but my wife is. And she uh, had communicated with veterinarians. And whenever somebody owns birds in their house, like parakeets or parrots or something like that, they inform those parents of those birds that if you have Teflon pans, you must get rid of them because the birds are so sensitive that when you cook on a Teflon pan, it uh, those those chemicals that are in those pans can uh, be, uh, become aerosols and could uh, be inhaled by the birds and can actually kill the birds. When I heard that, I'm like, oh my God, the fact that anyone's still using Teflon plans, please get rid of them right away. Uh, and that's just one little anecdote. I have to do more research on that. But again, that's just from my wife sharing with me about, you know, birds being sensitive to Teflon pans. So we now have all ceramic and I do occasionally microwave food but I no longer microwave food in plastics. Even if they say dishwasher safe, microwave safe, I now use glass. So we use, we use uh, Pyrex, um, uh, you know, glass uh, Tupperwares for all of our food to help store them. And then the last thing is whenever you buy water and maybe there is an emergency where you have to buy water, I really look at, at where that water is coming from. I, I pick up the water bottle. I'm like, where's the source? If it's, if it's distilled and then added minerals, that's the best water, right? Because that's like the cleanest that it can be, uh, high, uh, high pH, um, you know, alkaline water. But where's that source? Where did that water come from? Distilled the best. The next level is reverse osmosis. I want to read that. If they say purified water, what level of purification did they provide it? I have no idea. Um, you know, I remember at one point Dasani and uh, what's the other one? You know, Pepsi, Coca-Cola has Dasani and uh, Aquafina was the other one. They used to do reverse osmosis water and I would always feel happy that I would drink it, but it cost too much for the filtration. So they moved and they said, oh, we're not using, we're just having the most state of the art seven part water filtration system and they gave it some funky name. Basically, they moved away from reverse osmosis to some other lower quality, um, uh, you know, drinking water. Listen, drinking some water is better than not drinking any water at all, even if it's in a plastic bottle, even if, uh, you know, nothing else is there. Because we can get really crazy about this, but it's important that, you know, we don't go crazy, you know, uh, about it. So uh, I would always read those um, water filtrations on the back of those bottles and things like that. So anytime I can, reverse osmosis it is and adding those minerals. So hopefully that's helpful and it's good for other people as well. So 
thank you for such a great question. I really appreciate that. And I'm just going to see some other final comments. Oh, Kieran acknowledged that was a great question. So thank you for that. Most company events or nonprofit events have plastic water bottles. I know, Kieran, isn't it so sad for people to drink? Should people refuse them because they might be contaminated? Well, guess what? We need to educate the public, you know? And so that must mean it's say, hey, thank you so much for this water bottle, but I prefer not to have this water bottle, even because it's plastic. And even if it says it's BPA-free, we know that BPA uh, has its cousin chemicals that these companies are using and it's leaching the water and is causing a, a lot of health, uh, negative health effects, right? Uh, whether it's, um, uh, you know, cancer, uh, um, uh, low fertility, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we do have to educate people about that. And um and just uh, you know, don't accept them or take them. Be nice about it, and and then recycle them. What else can I can I say? Yeah, I would not use them. So should people refuse them? Yes, I would, or educate them, or you know, just take it and recycle it. What about Fiji Avion Essential Water Bottle brands? Each one is different. So again, I know uh, Essentia. I believe is distilled, don't quote me on that. And then they add high uh, minerals to have a high pH. So it's very uh, alkaline, right? If I'm using that correctly, like I think a low pH is acidic and high pH is, is uh, uh, the opposite um, of alkaline. And so again, those are all these minerals, but remember our body is supposed to have a, P, a certain pH. We're not meant to be so acidic or so alkaline. The reason why people want to drink all these waters with all these high alkalinity is because they we are so contaminated and we eat so much bad food, fried foods and stuff like that, that as we've talked in some of the other trainings, our bodies, if you have all these different types of food substances, your body can become very acidic, like you're changing the pH levels from everything that you're consuming. So therefore, high alkalinity uh, drinks to help restore and balance that would be beneficial. But the problem is if you're already a healthy individual, drinking these high pH waters long-term may not be the best health benefits for you, right? Because we're not meant to drink water with that such high pH. So that's just something to keep in mind. I have different health, uh, uh, different experts that have recommended not doing these high pH waters, these very alkaline waters. Um, also, Fiji... Um, a lot of these waters, like in, in New York, we have Poland Spring Water. In California, they have another brand. I think it was called Arrowhead brand when I used to live in California. These waters are from springs. So what does that mean? That means they, they drilled holes into the ground or into a mountain and pulled water directly out of the aquifer and put it in a bottle. OK, and then what they can do is they can say, oh, well, I did a little uh, of testing. Is this water clean according to our list of what's acceptable contaminant? Nope, it's still clean, even though if it has a little contaminants, we're going to send it and, and have people consume it. So spring water, just because it's spring water, ooh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's good or clean water. There's been many studies that says that bottled water is not as clean uh, as even some municipality waters. So you have to be very careful. Um, Fiji water is another version of that, but they use artesian wells. So meaning that it's kind of like spring water where they have to like drill into a mountain or drill down and suck the water out. Artesian wells are wells that are uh, uh, aquifers that are really, really deep within a mountain, whatever it is. And there's so much pressure that the moment that, that, that the hole is drilled, the water shoots up because you've had all this filtration and then they pull out the water, an artesian well, right? So that's what they advertise. Again, it is not filtered. It is not reverse osmosis. So it could have great, um, you know, um, properties, a lot of different minerals. It could be cleaner than most maybe municipalities, but you have to understand it is not filtered, right? And uh, and how much unlimited water supply does Fiji have? I'm always curious because it's promoted everywhere. We used to drink Fiji waters because they were their bottles were very environmentally friendly because when you have a bunch of round bottles, whenever they're shipped, that's there's so much empty space that you're using a lot of gas and fossil fuels. So Fiji being environmentally conscious created a square bottle so you could pack more waters in so it was better for the environment. So I remember, you know, drinking that when I was younger. But again, if I had a bottle of water, would I, if I'm going to, you know, Fiji is an artesian well, if I had to choose between Fiji and maybe a smart water, I might just do smart water just because I know that it's distilled and minerals added 
versus I don't know what's in, uh, uh, you know, Fiji or they have not filtered out any contaminants or, you know, but that's just my personal opinion. I'll let you guys decide what you want to do is best. OK, also life water. I'm not familiar with life water, so I can't comment on that. Just got a glass of water bottle from Amazon because I've been using a plastic one from school. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah. So just be careful, uh, Susan, about um, breaking it, because even though my wife had that silicon cushion, all it takes is one little drop or one little banging on the table and it could break and you have all this water leak out. So just one of the things you have to be careful of. Does anybody have any other final questions or comments? That was great questions. And I'm glad that we could elaborate and talk a little bit more about that. It came with a purple sleeve. <laughs> Laugh out. Okay, awesome, Susan. I'm glad that it came with that. All right. Any other final question or comment? Kieran, did you want to share anything? I, I don't know if you have had a chance to respond or share. I, I I do remember you shared on the chat, Kieran. So thanks so much for uh, what you're doing. And and I know that you're using Brita, but maybe you can hopefully <laughs> upgrade to some higher filtration system. And then the last one, Zohop, are you still there? Do you want to even give him any final comment before we sign off? No problem, Zohab. Okay. You just might not be available right now. All right. Well, thank you so much. I hope that you learned a lot of uh, valuable information about getting clean water and what you can do to now take ownership um, of uh, in reducing contaminants that are in your body. What I'm going to do is in the... In the uh, chat, I'm going to post the post assessment because I love your feedback on this training. What did you like? What can we do? How can we improve it? Um, also, once I upload this load video to YouTube, I'll also put it in the, the notes of that uh, YouTube video so that you can also do the post assessment. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Let's become resilient. Let's have clean bodies, clean water, and reduce contaminants in our world so that we can have uh, live the most resilient and healthy life. So thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.